Hello, friends, and welcome to the February 24th edition of Weekly Witness, Texas Impact's weekly podcast designed to help mainstream Texans of faith understand the legislative process and help you engage with the Texas legislature. My name is Scott Atnip, your host and Texas Impact's Director of Public Witness, and this week we wrap up Texas Impact's Texas Interfaith Advocacy Days week with a conversation with friend of the program, Guthrie Graves Fitzsimmons, Communications Director for BJC, the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Freedom. Guthrie joins us on the podcast after his boss, Amanda Tyler, the executive director of the BJC, joined us in person in Austin for Interfaith Advocacy Days to talk about Christian nationalism and their work to mobilize people of faith, and specifically Christians, to speak out against Christian nationalism. But before we get to Guthrie, I want to take a moment to thank all of you who attended Interfaith Advocacy Days. It was a jam-packed three-day event with some really great capital visits on Tuesday. Those attending, both in person and online, really set the foundation for the work Texans of Faith need to do, both in terms of advocating for justice and equality, but also doing the work back home to make sure our representatives and our communities know that people of faith support just and equitable policies. Y'all, we still have a lot more work to do, but this was a good start, and I hope that you'll take advantage of Texas Impact Tools to resource your work back home. Go to texasimpact.org and click on Take Action to find out how you can get involved during the legislative session, and then click on Texas Faith Votes to find tools to help you begin to plan for the next election season, and y'all, that work has to start right now. All right, I think that's enough intro for today. I hope you enjoyed this week's conversation with Guthrie Graves Fitzsimmons. Joining us for today's conversation is Guthrie Graves Fitzsimmons, Communications Director for the BJC in Washington, D.C. And y'all, full disclosure, I have known Guthrie since he was maybe a junior high or high school student, and I was a college student camp counselor at United Methodist Camp in East Texas. Um, So it's Guthrie, it's certainly been exciting to watch you on your journey, and I appreciate you taking the time today. Always good to be with you, Scott. Thanks for having me back on the podcast. I love having Texans who are going off and doing amazing things. And speaking of Texans, we were uh, we were talking before we started recording today. Earlier this week, we had Amanda Tyler, uh, the BJC executive director, and another Texan uh, join the Texas Impact team in Austin for our Texas Interfaith Advocacy Days, which just wrapped up with capital visits uh, this Tuesday. Uh, but her conversation focused on Christ- Christian nationalism. And we'll certainly get into that uh, during the course of this conversation. But before we get to that, why don't you start out by telling us about BJC and your work? Sure. And thanks for highlighting Amanda's um, being a Texan. You know, I I love working for a Texan and talking to Texans and Texas faith-based advocacy. I married a Texan, you know, (laughs) all things Texas. I love having this opportunity (laughs) to discuss. So BJC, or Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty, is an 87-year-old religiously-based organization working to defend the religious freedom of everyone. So we approach this both as out of our Baptist theological tradition of soul freedom and religious freedom, and then also from a constitutional perspective of defending the First Amendment's guarantee of faith freedom for all. So we uh, do it in both those senses, and we do it at the Supreme Court, through friend of the court briefs. We do it through educational programming. We have this great program I want to plug called BJC Fellows, where we have young professionals aged 25 to 45 go to a kind of intensive training program. And the application uh, are open right now. So I hope people will apply for that. And so we do it through advocacy, education, And then through the Christians Against Christian Nationalism campaign, which is an ecumenical effort to address Christian nationalism. And so y'all are doing incredible work, and and we're going to talk about some of that work uh, in just a minute. But one of the things that that our listeners, you know, people of faith are are really interested in is is the why question 
in terms of why people do this work. And so uh, as somebody who's known you for a long time, it's it's been really exciting for me to, to watch that development, watch your journey um, from, you know, a, a kid at church camp to somebody who's now working uh, in communications for BJC, somebody who's authored a book. I think last time we were on, uh, last time we had you on the program, you talked about uh, your new book at the time, Just Faith, Reclaiming Progressive Christianity. Uh, and now you're doing this work uh, kind of focused on Christian nationalism and a lot of different issues. Why have you chosen to spend your life doing this work? So there's kind of two routes to this current job for me. One is professional and then one is personal, but it all starts in the Methodist church I grew up in in Houston, which had a very strong social justice um, commitment and being the son of two labor union organizers who also raised me kind of in the social justice movement, the work for economic and social racial justice, immigrant justice, and then the lessons I was taught in Sunday school growing up and heard preached from the pulpit all seem part of that same idea of valuing human dignity. And so I sensed this calling from an early age from preaching on Youth Sunday and being active in uh, different programs of the Methodist Church. Um, we had a peace and justice program that I got involved with in high school. I was just really drawn from uh, that, that age to the work of faith and social justice and public policy in particular. And I didn't really know what that looked like. So I studied religion in college, and then I studied religion more in seminary, a unique theological seminary. I just started, again, I'm very excited to be back in theological education at Iliff School of Theology, doing a doctor nice. of ministry and prophetic leadership. So I've, I've pursued this uh, through education, and I've also worked in faith-based advocacy now for over a decade, starting in immigration work, trying to create a pathway to citizenship for the undocumented. Then I moved into addressing anti-Muslim bigotry and Islamophobia. And in that job is actually where I first learned about BJC, because everyone will remember the former President Trump's Muslim ban. And mm -hmm. BJC was one of the leading voices from a Christian perspective arguing against the Muslim ban and the Supreme Court case that was called Trump v. Hawaii. And that's where I first learned about them. They were part of this campaign called Shoulder to Shoulder, which is a, a ecumenical effort to address Islamophobia. And I really started resonating um, with a lot of what they were doing and got to meet my now boss, Amanda Tyler. And the general counsel, Holly Holman, through this work addressing Islamophobia. Then I went on to work at the Center for American Progress. And one of my goals at the center at CAP was to uplift the work that religious leaders were doing and make sure people addressing public policy in D.C. knew what was going on from a faith-based perspective. One of the things we did was publish Q&As with different faith leaders. And I remember towards the end of 2021, I was making a list of the faith leaders I really wanted to draw more attention to. And Amanda Tyler is at the top of my list. And so I, <laughs> we started doing a Q&A and it was so funny and fortuitous that while I was doing this Q&A being like, people need to know about this work. I saw the job listing for communications director at BGC. Uh, and so I was like, wow, those things, you know, I'm really sensing I could do this work full time, not just through one Q&A with her. And that was actually the last thing I published at CAP was an interview with Amanda. So that was the kind of professional track to this job. And then the personal track is I, over time, uh, sensed a calling to leave the Methodist church over being banned from ordination because I'm gay. And I joined a Baptist church in Louisville. So right. I also had this personal kind of trajectory to becoming a Baptist, learning so much about the Baptist tradition, though I still have a lot of fondness for the Wesleyan tradition as well. And that was another reason I am so glad to now be working professionally in this Baptist organization. So that was a long answer, Thanks. but all roads led to this, I feel like. Well, uh, as a United Methodist, I'll just say we miss you, but I am happy that you have found a, uh, a place and a calling and we're excited for, and I'm back at a, uh, for your work there. Yeah, and I'm back at a Methodist 
school. So I love connecting <laughs> at Iowa right. with um, a lot of Methodists. Yeah. And, and so many people doing this great work, uh, so many people of faith who are doing this justice work, this advocacy work for inclusion, for justice. Uh, and that's an important part of our heritage. And that's an important part of, of the work that many of us feel called to. And so Amanda talked during her presentation when she was in Austin uh, this week about the importance of faithful religious advocacy uh, but also con- contrasted that with um, with Christian nationalism. And so I wonder if you can talk, first of all, ha- how do you define Christian nationalism um, and how does that contrast with the work for a prophetic witness uh, for justice by many in the faith community? Sure, and that's a great question. And it's something we hear so much is people want to bring their faith to their advocacy, their activism, their, they want to bring their whole selves, including their religious self, to their public life. And we want to encourage that while also making sure there are some guardrails against theocracy. And I think that's a message that most faith-based activists I know that resonates. We bring our faith uh, to our activism without trying to impose it on other people in a sort of authoritarian, theocratic way. But you also mentioned the definition of Christian nationalism. We define it as a political ideology and cultural framework that merges our Christian and American identities. And in the process, Christian nationalism distorts both our Christian faith, it is separate from Christianity, and it distorts America's constitutional democracy and guarantee of faith freedom for all. This idea that America is a Christian nation is a false idea, and it's one that has um, gone back throughout history. There's been different times that Christian nationalism has seen a resurgence. Christian nationalism is one form of religious nationalism. It's certainly not unique. Religious nationalism, religious nationalism is not unique to the United States. We see different religious, uh, different forms of religious nationalism in other countries. And when we say Christian nationalism, I think it's important to highlight that we're talking about a particular form of Christianity that is being championed, one that is white, male, straight, that really is about those who have held power at our nation's founding and trying to go, you know, return the country to that. And that's why the Christians Against Christian Nationalism campaign says in our statement of principles that Christian nationalism overlaps with and provides cover for white supremacy. You also hear people talk about white Christian nationalism and calling that out specifically has been part of the campaign from the beginning. So you've talked about uh, rises of Christian nationalism over the course of, of you know, particularly here in, in the United States. Uh, at various periods of time. Are you seeing it more now? And what are some some examples of what that might look like uh, that folks might recognize? I think there's certainly more awareness of Christian nationalism. A lot of that came from the insurrection. On January 6th, we saw different elements of Christian nationalism that BJC documented in a report with the Freedom From Religion Foundation that people can access on our website. And that was a time, our campaign started before then, but that was a time that a lot of people took notice of how Christian nationalism was leading to extremism and violent extremism. We also saw a member of Congress claim to be a Christian nationalist. That's Marjorie Taylor Greene. And I think it would be easy for us to write off Marjorie Taylor Greene as one kind of very extreme person But what we didn't see was when she said that, a large rebuke from many Republicans. Religion News Service actually asked asked a lot of Republicans what was their reaction. Marjorie Taylor Greene said the GOP should be the party of Christian nationalism. And almost all of, there were a couple exceptions, but almost all of those Republicans in Congress didn't respond. So there, we risk normalizing Christian nationalism when we have a member of Congress actually calling for it explicitly. There have been also other members that have said very concerning things about the separation of church and state, and then different candidates kind of on the far right really embracing 
this Christian nationalist ideology as a political tool. One thing I want to be careful about, though, is that we don't get into us versus them framing. We don't label one group of people Christian nationalists and then we're the other people that are calling out the Christian nationalists. We see Christian right. nationalism as an ideology that impacts all of us. And so we see elements of Christian nationalism in all kinds of churches. We see flags in churches. We see people bringing religion and politics together in a way that we don't find helpful or constitutional or, uh, you know, um, in many different churches. So we try to really refrain from that um, us versus them thinking. Yeah, we, we definitely all have work to do um, on that front. Uh, Guthrie, this is a, a public policy podcast and folks tune in uh, to, to learn about and think about what we can do to, to improve our public policy systems here in, in Texas and beyond. Uh, I wonder, given that audience, uh, if you can talk to us a little bit about where you might see uh, Christian nationalism show up in public policy. Uh, are there examples there that we should be watching out for? Sure, there are two main areas that I think your listeners should look out for. The first is how Christian nationalism impacts many different policy debates, whether that's gun issues, immigration, abortion, practically every issue, you will hear theocratic arguments. You'll hear people saying, God demands we do this and enact this law. You'll see legislators say a version of that from the floor of the legislature. You'll hear people read Bible verses. You'll hear people talk about God's judgment. That kind of infusion of Christian nationalism that implies or sometimes explicitly addresses that lawmakers should be enacting religious law as public servants needs to be called out and we need to rid policy debates of Christian nationalism across the board. That, of course, going back to your earlier question, doesn't mean there's an active role for religious leaders to advocate, but that advocacy needs to make room for people of all different faiths and the non-religious. So our public policy debate should be accessible for all people, no matter how you pray or if you want no um, nothing to do with religion, you should still be able to access our public policy debates. That's why I'm glad to see Texas Impact Interfaith Advocacy Days. Anytime you can advocate with other religions, that implicitly shows that you don't think one religious view should be enacted in law. And then going back to the January 6th report we did with Freedom From Religion Foundation, that was a way to show by our partnership with an explicitly um, non-religious organization that we are bringing our unique Baptist voice to public policy debates and the work of the January 6th committee, but we're always trying to be intentional about doing that in a way that doesn't imply one religion should be preferenced or religion should be preferenced over non-religion, both of those things. So that's sort of policy debates at large, but then there are also specific Christian nationalist policy proposals that need to be defeated such as in putting in God we trust in school displays, uh, teaching the Bible in public schools. Of course, it's okay to teach religion, and there's a good uh, place to teach religion in social science courses about religious diversity, but the Christian nationalist effort is to teach what sometimes amounts to like Bible study in public schools. Then in God we trust license plates. There's this, you can go to, uh, something called Blitz Watch, which tracks Project Blitz, which is trying to pass these Christian nationalist style bills. And opposing those, I hope people will oppose those as Christians and as people of faith, because oftentimes opponents of those bills will get um, portrayed as anti-religious or anti-God. And so those bills are some of the most important places for faith-based advocacy. 
that people stand up and say it's not re- anti-religious to support the separation of church and state. In fact, supporting the separation of church and state allows all religious communities to thrive and be free from government interference. Yeah. So again, we are in Texas and you know, Texas. And when you're going through your list of examples, uh, I was sitting here thinking, yeah, I've, I've heard all of those things on the Texas house floor. And so we certainly have work to do. And I think, I think you're right. Uh, that, that people of faith specifically have to speak up on these issues from a perspective of faith uh, so that those in power know that there is not unanimity among, uh, among the religious community in Texas on these issues. And so we do have to, as faith leaders, um, raise our voice on that. Can I just one more um, thing, Scott? I, I feel yeah. like I, w- I want to add a dose of positivity to the public policy debate. There are things we can do proactively to resist Christian nationalism and support faith freedom for all. We can recognize diverse religious holidays. We can make sure that people of all faiths and none feel welcome and celebrated as part of Texas's religious diversity or our country's religious diversity. So I think there's also a place for positive religious yeah. legislation as well. I just wanted to add that. I. I am a natural optimist, so if I feel I'm going on too long about all the things that are wrong, I want to add that in. And and for folks who just tuned in today for Guthrie, which is great, you should also know that just last week, uh, our guest on this very same program was uh, State Representative Salman Bojani, who is the first Muslim uh, and South Asian elected in the Texas House, one of two that were elected and sworn in this January. But he talked about his religious freedom agenda, which is um, getting bipartisan support. And one of the pieces in that in that package is uh, recognizing more holidays and, and various things. And so uh, there are opportunities there and that, that passed the Texas house last time. So we've got some work to do in the Senate this time. Uh, so yeah, there, there are some good things going as well. I appreciate that optimism and a reminder that there, there are bipartisan opportunities to get some good work done even here um, in Texas. Uh, but, uh, that said, uh, we do still have, uh, many challenges in front of us here in the great state of Texas. Uh, and you have some opportunities for us. Uh, but, um, before we get into shameless plugs, talk to us about what we should do, uh, what listeners could do, um, to, uh, combat Christian nationalism here in Texas and beyond. I hope anyone who is listening, who is a Christian gets involved in Christians against Christian nationalism. You can go to christiansagainstchristiannationalism.org to sign the statement and make a public declaration of your opposition to Christian nationalism and your support for religious freedom for all. I'm also excited that we're launching our first local chapter of the campaign in the North Texas area. I'll be in Dallas in just a few weeks to meet with local Christian leaders and partners of other religious traditions to start building a local organizing effort on the ground to combat Christian nationalism. It's something we're piloting in the Dallas-Fort Worth, North Texas area, but hope to expand to many other regions of the country in the coming years. There are many resources if you want to have a discussion in your church about Christian nationalism on our website. And I want to give one example of something recently we did uh, on the actual second anniversary of the January 6th insurrection. We organized with Faithful America a prayer vigil across the street from the U.S. Capitol. As the sun rose um, that day, we marked the anniversary, mourned all of the um, Christian nationalism and violence of that day, and prayed for religious freedom, democracy, peace, healing, all of those things. And over one of the reasons we did it is because over and over again, we saw stories about January 6th, you know, focus on all of the Christian nationalist efforts, uh, elements of that day. And we wanted to provide a counter witness And it was a really powerful morning, uh, just praying together and having that um, peaceful moment on the anniversary of such an awful day. Yeah. So whatever it looks like, uh, we also worked with Faithful America. There's this Reawaken America tour going around the country of Mike Flynn, Roger Stone, 
and just it's overt Christian nationalism. And we've worked with faith leaders uh, along the tour to have them do a counter witness at a local church to say, this isn't Christianity. These people don't speak for us and getting involved um, in the campaign that way. So whatever it looks like in your local community, in your local church, I hope you will get involved in the campaign, use our resources, and then publicly offer a different vision um, from what Christian nationalism offers, one that I, I think is really needed right now, and it's needed particularly from a Christian perspective. Back before I started at BJC when they were thinking about this campaign, it was originally imagined as an interfaith effort. And some of our non-Christian partners told BJC, this Christians need to speak out about this in particular, and you're able to as Christians, and this is a really needed effort. So that's why we particularly targeted this to Christians. So all the Christians listening, I hope you'll join us. And so I'm assuming if folks in North Texas sign uh, the Christians Against Christian national Nationalism pledge, I guess it is, uh, that they'll get information about the the efforts in North Texas? Yes, and we're currently hiring a our first ever field organizer to be based in the area. So that person, we're going to hand them, you know, the list of everyone who signed, and they'll be going out and doing that outreach in the community. Excellent. So folks across the state, uh, this is really important uh, that we uh, keep this conversation front and center, look for examples of it near us and call it out. Uh, but especially, you know, and I think Amanda said it, um, there are a lot of Christian nationalists in North Texas, but there are also a lot of uh, well-meaning good people of faith um, who are who are ready to do this work. And so I hope, uh, especially th there in North Texas, you'll get involved, um, sign up and look for ways that you can participate. Um, Guthrie, really appreciate the conversation. Any other shameless plugs or uh, last minute thoughts you'd have for us? Just good luck with Interfaith Advocacy Days and all of your work at Texas Impact. All right, Guthrie, it's good catching up with you. Appreciate all you do. And thanks for the time today. Thank you. I'd like to thank Guthrie for joining us for the conversation and thank Amanda Tyler for joining us for the event, but I especially want to thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and are ready to speak out against Christian nationalism. Again, it was so good to see many of you in Austin this week, and I look forward to seeing many more of you in the weeks to come. We look forward to resourcing your advocacy, and I'm happy to try my best to answer your questions, so feel free to reach out at scott at texasimpact.org. As we wrap up, make sure that you are subscribed to the podcast and sharing it with your friends and congregations, and go to texasimpact.org for other ways you can get involved during the legislative session. While you're there, make sure that you and your congregation sign up to be members of Texas Impact to support this podcast and the work of Texas Impact year-round. And with that, I think it's time to close out this episode, so remember, the world needs Texans of faith active and engaged. So let's get to work. Weekly Witness is hosted by Scott Atnett, engineered and produced by David Pasalo. Our executive producer is B. Moorhead. The opinions expressed on Weekly Witness are those of Texas Impact and our guests and do not necessarily reflect the views of our sponsors. Weekly Witness is a product of Texas Impact, people of faith working for justice. Visit us online at texasimpact.org.